Good morning, and uh, welcome to CSIS. Um, Happy New Year. Um, I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS from the Global Health Policy Center, and we're thrilled today to be able to welcome Eric Goosby and our other guests for the roundtable uh, here. Before we uh, launch into introductory remarks, I want to make one announcement. Uh, since April of last year, we've had here at CSIS a commission on smart global health policy. 25 eminent individuals who joined us in this effort will be uh, releasing the report and recommendations from that commission on February 10th uh, at 10 a.m. at the Mayflower Hotel. Many of you will have received a save the date notice for that, but please put that in your calendar, a run from 10 a.m. to noon on February 10th at the Mayflower Hotel. Please join us for that. In putting this event together, a number of people have put a, 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 an enormous amount of effort in, in getting us organized, and I just want to acknowledge them. Um, Emily Poster, Daniel Porter, Lisa Carty, uh, uh, Elizabeth Morehouse, Seth Gannon, Russ Oates from here at CSIS, uh, from OGAC, uh, Ann Gavigan, uh, welcome and thank you so much for being with us, and Tom Walsh. Special thanks to my colleague Andrew Schwartz from CSIS, uh, head of our external affairs. This is a partnership that he has engineered uh, over the last six months with the University of Miami Knight School of Communications. We're very proud of that and very proud to be working here with the University of Miami. And we're joined today by Sonjaya Kenya, a member who will be introduced momentarily by our moderator who has come up from Miami. I want to add that Donna Shalala, former HHS Secretary and President of the University of Miami, uh, has been a very active member of our Commission on Smart Global Health Policy, for which we're very grateful. Um, thanks to Mariam Atash Nawabi, anchor of American Abroad Media, for agreeing to be here today uh, and moderating. And very uh, much thanks to uh, my colleague at CSIS, Phil Nyberg, who Mariam will introduce in a moment. Uh, we're very excited here today to hear from Eric Goosby, the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator, uh, to hear really about current thinking on U.S. prevention approaches on HIV. Early on, during his confirmation, as he entered his office uh, in August, as he launched the new five-year strategy, Eric's made very clear that prevention occupies a, a new higher priority place in U.S. policy approaches. And for many of us, this is a very welcome change. And many of us are eager to hear his thinking and more details on the strategy and approaches looking forward. We know that prevention is innately a very difficult and complex issue. We also know that a great, a great deal about what works and what does not work. Uh, we at CSIS have for a long time uh, given priority to prevention. We had, a, for six years, had an active working group on, on HIV prevention as part of our CSIS task force on HIV AIDS. And over the past year, with the leadership of Lisa Carty and Phil Nyberg, we assembled in the summer an expert group to examine U.S. approaches on prevention. We've issued a report. I hope you've had a chance to get it. It's been distributed here today. There are a couple of big themes that come out of that work. One is making full use of U.S. leadership at the national and global levels, and engaging other political leadership of partner, partner governments as well as, as inter <coughs> international bodies to take up prevention in a new and different way, to lever leverage our future commitments. And that gets us into a difficult terrain of conditionality, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. What do you do as resources get tighter and as prevention becomes a higher priority, what do you do when you run into obstacles in terms of of malgovernance or, uh, or resistant governments in taking on the challenge of reducing stigma and improving access by men who have sex with men, injection drug users, commercial sex workers, when, when you have a repressive legal environment that is not being reformed. We've put a big focus in our work on concentrating resources where, is, where most needed, to focusing prevention efforts and knowing the epidemic, and lastly, in investing great in greater metrics, better evidence base, and research. And perhaps we should consider, this may come up in the course of the discussion today, uh, uh, expanding the advisory network to bring in more systematically uh, advice from non-official experts on prevention into this. This morning what we're going to do is I'm going to moment, in just one moment introduce Eric. Eric's going to come and do a presentation. Uh, upon completion of that, our other guests, Mariam, Sonjaya, and Phil will come forward here and we'll move into a round table uh, portion of our, of our morning. And um, that'll be an interactive conversation for 20 or 30 minutes, followed by 
opening for the last uh, portion of our program, uh, opening to the audience for, for questions and comments uh, from you. Please just come forward to the microphones here. So my honor to introduce Eric Goosby. He's known to many, if not all of you, uh, for his work over the years. Since August, he has been the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator, responsible for overseeing the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief and the U.S. engagement in support of the Global Fund. Obviously, also, he is playing a pivotal role in this next phase in the launch of the President's Global Health Initiative. Eric is a friend to many of us. He's a leader. He's compassionate and committed, and somebody who's been committed to HIV, his commitment stretches back to the early 80s in San Francisco when he began treating patients at San Francisco General Hospital when AIDS first emerged and came to our attention. In the Clinton era, he served as Deputy Director of the White House National AIDS Policy Shop, Policy Office, and Director of the Office of HIV AIDS Policy at Health and Human Services. These were in pivotal moments uh, in both of those uh, uh, offices with respect to domestic policy and later into with respect to international. From 2001 to 2009, he served as the CEO and Chief Medical Officer at the Pangea Global AIDS Foundation in San Francisco, a highly innovative group that has put down in, these, in this last phase um, new programs on treatment and care and prevention in South Africa, Rwanda, China, Ukraine, among others. He has vast experience with international treatment guidelines, development of local models of care, and prevention strategies for high-risk populations. And we're very honored to have him here and thrilled that he's taken on this duty in service of this administration. So please join me in welcoming Eric Goosby. this in context of the 33.4 million people who were living on the planet with HIV, the 2.7 million new infections that are guesstimated to occur annually, uh, we still are predominantly looking at a burden of disease that falls in sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see, uh, and the figure that is repeatedly I hope you could have heard, heard from me before that. But, um, but uh, for every two people on ARVs, uh, there are five that become newly infected. My problem with this juxtaposition is, is that they're not related to each other, but, uh, but people um, look at that as some kind of a, a balancing. It's not an equation. It's just two separate facts there that I think we should uh, think about, have real implications for how we think about it. But, uh, cause and effect is not there. The National Intelligence Council estimated that by 2025 there could be as many as 50 million, 25 to 30 million of whom would require treatment at any given time. Our prevention efforts, uh, if scaled up, could dampen that trajectory, but we still are looking at a large number of patients. Uh, expanding from both those who are engaged in the treatment end of it, both for opportunistic infections and the initiation of antiretrovirals, uh, adding to the total number living, in addition to the influx of the 2.7 million annually. PEPFAR's goals uh, over the five-year uh, strategy have been outlined for you. Um, it's on our website, and uh, the annexes really have the detail of where and what we intend to engage with. We are, in addition to the transition from emergencies to sustainable, 
engaging our partner countries in a dialogue where an increasing level of responsibility and oversight management uh, is the focus, uh, to truly focus on that, and then to expand prevention care and treatment, uh, both in concentrated and generalized epidemics. Uh, the integration and investment in research and innovation become critical complements uh, to this core focus. The package of the biomedical, behavioral, and structural interventions are the biomedical, behavioral, and structural, uh, as defined here. Uh, we also uh, have strategically um, uh, uh, strategic opportunities to so-called combine our prevention opportunities on given specific populations to overlap uh, and synergize with the impact. Uh, this is an idea that we hope we can, in the course of our PEPFAR programs, uh, better understand and demonstrate uh, improved or added efficacy in a combination approach. So PEPFAR prevention will support countries in mapping, focusing on the demographics and moving from the demographics backward to see how these populations do or do not interface with the prevention effort uh, on a kind of geo-mapping level. Uh, to use the uh, data that we have from other uh, studies as well as the opportunities that are presented to us in country to converge our strategies, to converge on populations as we were saying, so we get combination prevention approaches uh, to be able within any given country to compare the convergent uh, the convergence of a specific menu of prevention interventions compared to another menu uh, to look at so different combinations with populations and to really be uh, positioned so we can better understand the relative impact of this approach and then to continue to uh, link treatment and care programs uh, in that uh, to ignore a strategy that uh, does not uh, emphasize those who are already HIV positive as a central target would be a missed opportunity. The recalibration is an example uh, in South Africa where an attempt uh, was made over the last uh, year, a little less than a year, six months or so, to re-engage um, the demographics and look at where the new serial conversions are mostly assumed to, be in, to occur in a geo mapping exercise and then trying to map uh, our uh, programs and see if we are indeed well or not well interfaced with where the new CO conversions are occurring. Uh, it has resulted in a shift of funding uh, from um, the uh, 23 uh, million uh, down to the 32.5 uh, and more importantly has better has allowed us to better interface our prevention programs with where we think uh, the virus is expanding through the population. So challenges to successful prevention programs is the lack of country um, data for planning and thinking about where uh, the prevention effort should concentrate, uh, a blanketing approach to the whole population uh, that does not take that into, um, uh, does not that take that into, uh, factor that into the thinking has uh, dominated too much and we're trying to flip that where more of our planning again is based in the uh, in what our understanding is of how the virus is moving. The fact of the matter that incorporating the fact that it's not just one epidemic for South Africa, it's uh, multiple epidemics uh, indeed geographically, uh, but if you take any one of those dots for any given uh, village, town, or city, uh, you have multiple epidemics within that city. To not have a strategy that approaches your prevention effort in that way, uh, again, is to uh, miss that opportunity. Uh, so understanding that better, more intimately, and tailoring our programs to accommodate that uh, becomes the exercise. The um, ability to match what we do know works uh, with uh, with uh, how we emphasize our allocation decisions and what we financially support uh, is another factor. Uh, becoming uh, more rigorous around uh, our abstinence and be faithful populations, uh, moving into and adding a capability to uh, refer uh, for those that are unwilling or unable 
uh, to a condom family planning strategy, uh, which is the complementary piece for those who cannot remain abstinent uh, in their uh, personal relationships. For multiple concurrent couple populations, this also becomes important uh, to converge those two capabilities. Our better, um, our understanding needs to expand. Uh, we need to document, uh, at least for uh, sampling, sentinel sampling of these projects, if not all of them, an ability to show that we indeed have connected uh, and have uh, conveyed uh, information that has resulted in a behavior change. Uh, measuring that, identifying that, understanding that has been a real challenge to everybody on the planet uh, to come up with process and uh, programmatic outcomes uh, to demonstrate impact uh, is really our goal. And we see this as a central piece both of our research, monitoring, evaluation, slash research um, uh, activities in PEPFAR uh, that needs to, in real time, inform our projects as to what and where and who we are uh, impacting. Uh, that will be increased. Uh, the ability to address stigma and discrimination is inherent in all our prevention activities as well as our treatment activities. Uh, emphasizing that, taking advantage of that, uh, engaging with uh, discussion with political leadership, policy makers, uh, not episodically, but in an ongoing way, both from our PEPFAR leadership, but as well as our diplomatic um, relationship and country through the State Department has been part of our strategy, uh, an expansion of our strategy with uh, the PEPFAR issues and the issues in Uganda and Rwanda in particular. Uh, the structural conditions are pair and parcel with that, looking at um, having less of an impact on this except indirectly, but looking at how laws and institutions uh, favor or diminish your ability to identify, enter, and retain patients in care. Uh, becomes a central piece of that discussion, understanding the relationship to uh, what would be um, uh, laws or uh, practices that push behavior more uh, underground, uh, being the thing we're trying to avoid. And um, we want to be nimble enough in our understanding of what we're doing uh, within any given community to identify efficacy uh, and move the machine to pre preferentially um, going down that uh, pathway uh, when we see something that uh, indeed does impact. Examples of uh, challenges uh, as you uh, look at this, prevention strategies uh, increasing um, uh, our ability here. Uh, these are all the, the standards that we have seen uh, everywhere. Your, uh, cervical barriers, HSV2, suppressive therapy, going on up to uh, your um, PMTCT condom male circumcision strategies. Uh, looking at this as uh, an attempt to move through a variety of different uh, menus uh, that would be able to converge on any given population to increase our ability to prevent infection. We still need uh, to move, as I've alluded to, to better understandings. Uh, effectiveness at the population level uh, is something that uh, we need to uh, be able to talk about better, to be able to understand better, uh, to be able to document better. The combination prevention efforts, uh, that does it work? Uh, is combination better than single? Uh, there's evidence to think that it should be. Uh, we are in a position as we move these programs not to pilot but to scale uh, to answer that more definitively at least with the populations we're in front of and our hope to, in, to increase our ability to uh, reduce incidence at least below the uh, prenatal numbers that we're seeing throughout these countries uh, is the uh, kind of surrogate goal that we're putting as the marker for each of our attempts. And then uh, as something to not to decide but to inform decision making, we are going to be looking at cost effectiveness of different projects in relation to uh, pre prevention of infection uh, as we uh, move forward. Uh, I've never um, really had a cost effective analysis that wasn't used to argue against a program, uh, uh, but it certainly is a critical piece to understand your program and your program's ability uh, to sustain itself. And uh, we need to increase our 
cost-effective understanding of most of our programs. So the idea is to work with our multilateral partners to ensure that the interventions uh, uh, provided <laughs> converge and are created, occur in an environment that does not increase uh, barriers to entering and retaining patients in care. Uh, we want to work actively against that on all fronts. We want to expand access to high quality interventions that converge on populations and hopefully will uh, reduce the number of new serial conversions and the burden of HIV on the medical delivery system and country. Uh, access to services based on uh, principles that are equitable and non-discriminatory become a critical foundation of that discussion. Pre supporting prevention efforts for women, integrated family planning, reproductive health linkages, uh, and uh, treatment programs uh, becomes the overall uh, kind of uh, 30,000 foot level of orchestration and scaling up programs that really aggressively take advantage of what is a low uh, hanging fruit opportunity that we identify, define, uh, and target our most at risk populations, uh, many of whom uh, are marginalized uh, and uh, again uh, move further and further away from uh, entry and retention into care. And I hope that uh, we will be able to add to our understanding of both the uh, difficulties and successes that we identify as we move these programs uh, to scale uh, and uh, aggressively identify efficiencies, redundancies, uh, eliminate uh, parallel systems of care that uh, really are not contributing to our ability to contain the infection. A much more detailed description in the annexes of our website uh, goes into a lot of the strategies that we uh, have teased out that we'll be implementing uh, over the next two to three years. And I would encourage you to uh, take a look at those for more detail. So, Steve, I'll stop it there and uh, move to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Goosby, for providing a uh, overview of what the new PEPFAR strategy is with the Obama administration. I think it's very helpful, and some of the questions and dialogue we have will pick up on what you discussed. Um, I first want to introduce our other two panelists that we have here. On my left is Dr. Sonia Kenya. Um, she is a manager for health disparities uh, at the JY Center for Social uh, Medicine and Health Equity at the University of Miami. Um, as was stated earlier, this program, the Global Challenges Program, is a partnership with the University of Miami's Knight Center for Media, and we try at each session to have someone from the university come and speak with us. Uh, she graduated with a degree in African American Studies from UCLA. She has two master's degrees and a PhD from Columbia University in Health Education. Uh, she was a Health Disparities Fellow at NIH from 2002 to 2006, and from 2007, she's been at the University of Miami. Uh, on my right is Dr. Philip Nyber. He uh, is a pediatrician, but he has uh, many years of public health experience from 1977 to 2003. <laughs> he was at the Center for Disease Control, and since then, he has been at the uh, Center for Strategic International Studies, working on the Global Health Policy Center. Um, he has his degrees from the Case Western University, his MD, and a Master's of Public Health from Johns Hopkins University. So I want to welcome both of our panelists in addition to Dr. Goosby. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Sanjeev uh, Chatterjee from the University of Miami's Knight Center for International Media. He's the Vice Dean there um, for supporting this program. It's, uh, we want to have this dialogue between a university and a research center and to get this information out actually to students we do have each session that's taped so that others can um, benefit from the information that's shared. Um, Dr. Gisby, I want to first start on the issue of funding. As we all know uh, programs can't do much unless they have money to back them up and although the funding for PEPFAR has increased 
it wasn't what the Obama administration had initially wanted it to be. Um, do you think that there is enough funding to actually put into place all the programs that you mentioned? Well, I think that um, the funding has increased and that has given us the ability not to um, uh, stop our expansion strategy because we are still looking not at not uh, a d decrease in activity but actually a steep increase in prevention activity. The constellation of programs that are in many of our larger countries are such that there are many efficiencies that can be identified really with uh, not real digging going on. Uh, looking for uh, situations where programs have been funded, uh, where multiple entities have been funded for the same population. So there's a more than an overlap of target population. Their catchment areas are really the same. Um, looking uh, for uh, an efficiency uh, to scale of number of those types of programs, matching it with the demographics will kind of do that uh, in a, a very clear way. We'll match the populations up with the programs and the access points. Uh, we also expect to be able to um, incur a lot of resource savings from a diminution in the cost of care and treatment. As we move into now the sixth year of PEPFAR, we are getting better at identifying, entering, retaining patients in care in all aspects of the disease, both treatment, care, as well as prevention. And that economy of scale is significant. The third big resource saving exercise is as we, and this is what I would say is the smaller of the three and will come in over the next two to three years, uh, is as we move to more country ownership of program, uh, there will be, um, and as our NGO community moves more toward mentoring and technical assistance, there will be savings that will be identified there as well. Um, Dr. Neuberg, I want to bring you into this discussion. There is uh, not a controversy, but varying viewpoints from advocacy groups that, you know, who's to value a life that, okay, it is, cheaper to put money into prevention and some other um, treatments that actually can treat other diseases. Uh, you know, the antiretroviral medicine is expensive, but if somebody needs it and we have it available, then why shouldn't we fund that as well? Well, it's, it's certainly true that, that uh, providing antiretroviral treatment to uh, people who are infected with HIV and who have AIDS is a very dramatic way of, uh, of extending lives. and. Um, um, on the other hand, the, the keeping people who are currently uninfected from, be, from becoming infected is also a way of, uh, of saving a life. Um, so it's, it's clearly a delicate balance. I mean, people who are currently on treatment obviously need to stay on treatment, but um, I, I think we have yet to confront the issue of how decisions are made about allocating any resources that are extra. And the same, the same is true about uh, other interventions that save lives in situations that are beyond HIV and for diarrhea and, and uh, vaccine preventable diseases. It's, it's a very difficult, uh, difficult situation to confront. So this issue is out there. These dollars are limited and they have to be allocated in a certain way. And um, there is this shift then from the prior pet farm that was more treatment oriented to more prevention and other integrated care. Um, Dr. Kenya, um, in terms of integrated care and how that can improve treatment, um, you mentioned earlier to me that you had gone to Cuba and you saw where this can work. Can you explain yeah. how this can actually work where a country manages a program and it does have positive impacts? I think we've, also, we've seen that in other countries as well. It's Thailand has a wonderfully renowned program, the 100% condom program. And really what both Cuba and Thailand did was they paid attention to the social norms and the behaviors that increase transmission in those countries. And what they did is they created social interventions that were effective in one, changing what is behaviorally considered acceptable, um, specifically homosexual behaviors. And they also went and intervened at the at the places where they knew the most, the highest rates of transmission were occurring, um, regardless of their legal status. So in Thailand, they introduced condoms into essentially sex workers, and they put laws in place and policies in place that really enforced 
um, the use of condoms in, at, within, with every sexual interaction. Um, they have some work to do since, that, since they have those great um, declines in their initial HIV transmission rates. However, what is particularly concerning about PEPFAR is it, I think that we are providing treatment and we're allocating a lot of resources to the places that need it most, but perhaps we're not paying enough attention to the social and the environmental conditions and the behaviors that are going on where we really have the opportunity to intervene in a meaningful way. And what I've seen in my own work locally in Miami is when you do pay attention to those social norms and you intervene um, with modes and methods that are relevant to the population that you're targeting, you can see very significant clinical outcomes. And it has not, we know the medicine works. It's not about the medicine. It's about the education and the access and all of the other sort of environmental barriers that prevent people, one, from knowing what their status is, knowing how they can either maintain their negative status or reduce the progression if they are currently positive. And um, I think that's an area where we have a lot of opportunity to grow with PEPFAR. Um, you mentioned these social norms. Um, you know, of course, treatment of AIDS is an issue that's bipartisan. Both parties want to address it. But there are some interesting shifts that are taking place with respect to um, party lines. Um, in the prior PEPFAR, there was this element of not providing as much funding for those programs that dealt you know, with family planning and that provided uh, care for sex workers and homosexuals. Um, in terms of the guidelines, Dr. Goosby, I mm -hmm. was reading that you know, some of them are written into law, so it may take some congressional changes, but some are policy. And some of them may be policies that you could actually impact. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the new guidelines and how this money can be spent, we have this pot of money, but then it's how can it be spent? There's this whole issue of opting out, that some of the faith-based organizations were able to opt out of those requirements, but that if these requirements are in place, that this will cause faith-based organizations to reduce their programs. What are the guidelines that uh, you think will be implemented in terms of how the money can be spent and what restrictions there may be? Well, we are aggressively focused on looking at our guidelines and matching it up with new perspectives around appropriateness need. We are committed to positioning the provider so they can respond to the needs of the patient that's in front of them. Not have an ideological belief system interface or get between that provider's ability to respond to those needs. And that is requiring a dialogue uh, both internally and externally with our implementing partners around the ability to identify, once these needs have been identified, to acknowledge a need to move that patient in front of someone then, if they are unwilling or unable, to address that need. Uh, so these referral consultative uh, relationships, which we do all over the world, uh, in the United States, right here in Washington, D.C., can accommodate a different philosophical, ideological, religious belief system as a barrier to that, but we are keen on making sure that that patient's needs are met. Will so. the guidelines require, let's say, a faith-based organization who doesn't agree with distributing condoms, will it require them, if they accept the funding, to provide that service, or can they opt out? Well, we will have to have a way for that patient to get the service. They may not deliver it, and we accept that. But the ability for that person to be referred to someone who can address that need is a basic medical ethical requirement that we are in clean discussion now to try to address. I also want to say that our faith-based organizations are very effective at what they do. They're some of our better implementers, uh, indeed, uh, are in settings that are not only are they better implementers, but they also are in settings where there's no one else. Uh, we need them to blanket the population needs in every country we're in. They're frequently not in urban settings, but they're in the rural setting. Uh, so uh, a way and a desire to find a way to keep them working for us and with us for the patient populations that they have been responding to for many years before PEPFAR and hopefully many years after uh, is the goal. And I'm confident we'll be able to figure this out. 
uh, and related to that, there's issues of countries who have various laws that might discriminate against certain patient groups, and that's been an issue with respect to getting the funding to the patients who need it. Um, I want to ask in terms of that restriction, um, you know, the CSIS report on this topic made recommendations that these country partnerships should be right. resource, resource more, that they will provide for more sustainability. Uh, but what recommendations are made for countries that may have those restrictions and not reach those populations? Well, I, I th that's a, a yet to be addressed issue as well. It, I mean, um, in the introduction, Steve Morrison mentioned the issues of conditionality, and, and I think that's um, an issue that, that the U.S. government in general is going to increasingly have to, have to confront. So, you know, since resources are scarce, and since there are lots of populations that need help, um, it makes sense to allocate resources to, to places that can use the most effectively and efficiently, and to, uh, um, and to not <coughs> to think about pr uh, putting fewer resources in places where um, HIV risk behaviors are criminalized, um, um, or where um, forced detoxification, for example, goes on in prisons. Um, so there are a number of issues there, and also there are also ethical issues in the way that Dr. Goosby was mentioning that um, have yet to be confronted, but but are, be, are um, coming closer and closer. And so, so obviously there are complications. Right. You know, there's the science of it and what can be done to help a patient, but we deal with uh, restrictions and guidelines based on ideological issues here that you mentioned, Dr. Goosby, as well as country laws that may also come into play. Uh, with respect to the country partnership, uh, Dr. Kenya, you mentioned you've seen examples where having the country manage the program has worked well. You mentioned Thailand and Cuba. Uh, but some advocates would also argue that there are some countries that have problems with corruption that whose health ministries do not perform well. So if we allocate more money through those ministries, do we think that the money will then reach the patient? Has CSIS in your report looked into this issue? Well, I, I think that's, <coughs> we didn't deal with it directly in, in, the, uh, in that report, but it's part of the same conditionality issue. It's, for example, it's the kind of principles that the Millennium Challenge Corporation is, has used or is using to, to allocate resources. And, um, and ultimately, um, because resources are limited, uh, I, I think it's the same, the same concern that resources should go to places where the lives can be extended the most or where the most people could be uh, kept uninfected from HIV. And so to the extent that um, uh, cor issues like corruption become a drag on the system, those, that, that has to be taken into account. Uh, and Dr. Grisby, following up on that, um, you know, part of the new strategy is to uh, shift these programs from a lot of these NGOs. It's been multi-tiered with different kinds of organizations providing the service and receiving the funding um, from this part of U.S. money. There's obviously other sources from multilaterals. Uh, would you say that capacity building for the public health ministries is going to be part of that effort to ensure that the money will be spent wisely? Yes, it, it will be a central part of it. Um, no one is talking about moving the effort just to the public sector. We're talking about engaging the public sector in a dialogue around increasing their current role around management, definition of unmet need, especially the prioritization of the unmet need, and then the allocation decisions. None of that necessarily means movement of money to public systems. Uh, that will not happen until we are sure that transparency also moves with it. Uh, it's not rocket science. We'll be able to figure that out and know if those resources are being used or not being used. Uh, there will be transgressions for sure, and we'll respond to them, but not to remove the entire pool of resources because of one transgression, but to find the bad guys and get them, uh, stop the transgression, and redirect those resources back to program. Uh, I'm confident that we can do that. In doing that, we will create a cadre of capability in the country that will serve our programs and the entire country's constellation of programs and needs for the future and indeed is a central piece of the contribution we want to make. So this will be a phase strategy. It might be different for one country. There's 15 countries yes. in PEPFAR versus another one, but that is one option that is being sought for sustainability reasons. That's right. Um, and, and Dr. Kenya, I want to ask you, you've analyzed the new PEPFAR strategy. You've been involved in this issue for 
uh, over 15 years, if you could make one recommendation to Dr. Guzbi and the Obama administration of, you know, what are some areas that should require more attention or could be more helpful, what would you recommend? An abstinence only strategy has never worked. It's never done anything, and I may be very ignorant, it's never done anything but increase the rates of disease and unwanted sexual consequences. So I think when we talk about encouraging abstinence and even giving our resources to organizations that will only promote abstinence, um, I think it's a huge mistake, and I think it really ignores our current science. And I think that we, we have many examples of this in our own country when we promote these types of policies with our programs and not, not providing accurate sex education to populations in need of it. We see the dire consequences. We've seen it here. We've seen men on the down low and how that's contributed to HIV disparities, racial disparities in the United States. And we see where these racial, um, these ideologies contribute to very, very um, disturbing outcomes all over the world. And we should be a leader in advocating that science-based programs that have proven outcomes, um, that's what we support. We don't support ideological, I mean, we have a problem with that in our own country, and I think the last, you know, that was a very, very uh, motivating push about why we changed the administration. So um, I'll let Dr. Grisby respond to that. Isn't the Obama administration actually opening it up more to not focus on more of an abstinence strategy as the prior administration did? Yes. We, much of our attention is looking at a way to expand the service constellation for the providers that had been just in an abstinence-based dialogue to include uh, condom and referral into family planning and other health services. Uh, that response is a critical piece of, um, of what is needed and we hope that working again with the entire community that's already uh, engaged in this work uh, to uh, look at the services that we are able to put in front of patients as the primary goal. And Dr. Nieberg, I have the CSIS report that I read on this topic. It's very helpful, provides succinct recommendations. Now that the new PEPFAR strategy just came out last month, um, in analyzing that, what would you say could be done uh, more um, that was in the CSIS recommendations that may be perhaps not included in the new strategy? Well, I, I actually think that uh, the new strategy does a good job of, of hitting the same, the same kinds of issues that, that we, we were focused on. It. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, certainly the, the appendices or annexes, I guess they're called, that cover in detail most of the, most of the issues. I think one thing that might uh, might be interesting to think about, it might be useful um, to think about, is is having indicators that are more population based than individual patient based. Um, so, for example, the the uh, president's malaria initiative has a, an explicit goal of reducing. Um, Malaria infection, malaria deaths in the pop in the population by 50 percent. Um, the PEPFAR goals up to now have been focused on the, the population, the medical model, people who come into the into the programs rather than a population mm -hmm, based. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that's one of the reasons. I mean, there are obviously large differences between controlling malaria and controlling HIV/AIDS, um, but but it might be easier to um, help target resources um, if there were population-based goals like that. And picking up on that, one of the shifts with the new strategies, I understand it, is to integrate the treatment of HIV AIDS with malaria and TB. And in your prior role at CDC, you actually led a department right. that did all three, so you're well versed with this. Uh, do you think that that is possible with the limited resources that are available, that if it has to be allocated in certain areas, do we have enough money to do that? Well, for tuberculosis, um, which is probably the bigger, the bigger problem of, of the, those other two, I think it is possible, and, and that's because, in general, TB programs are already well-resourced in most places. So the, the issue is really integrating the program so that people, uh, HIV-infected people, can have their TB detected and, and treated, and, and reverse, uh, making sure that uh, new uh, or current TB patients ha have their HIV de um, infections detected. So I, I think that integration, which took a long time to get started, is now, is now moving along pretty well, and I, I think that'll go pretty well. Malaria may be a little tougher. We haven't, we're not very far down that road yet, but we'll see. Uh, picking up on that prevention versus uh, treatment, 
Um, America Abroad Media actually just recently did a whole one hour radio piece on this topic, having gone to different countries to assess this. And the, you know, the findings were, again, that the treatment has been effective for those patients who received it, but that the problem just keeps outgrowing the solution. As you said earlier, there's just more patients who keep uh, getting HIV than are being treated. Um, as part of the new PEPFAR strategy, you mentioned some of the numbers that are being targeted. Um, how much more money will it take to actually achieve those goals, given this problem that's multiplying more than the solution we have? So it, um, that's, a, that's a difficult one to respond to because it kind of depends on how you cut the pie up. But uh, if you look at the number of patients uh, on antiretrovirals now, look at the 200 to 350 change the WHO recommendation change has created, um, you know, you're still looking at 33.4 million people who eventually, at some point in time, uh, sooner or later, are going to need antiretroviral therapy. Uh, matching as aggressive a response as was mounted for treatment with prevention is the goal here. And we need to turn the volume up on every aspect of that and take advantage of every component of that. Um, but at the same time, uh, not ignore those already infected. Uh, to abandon them stops the murder that puts people in queue to get tested for a reason uh, and to not understand the disease to be the kiss of death, which is really how it is largely perceived and is a huge motive for stigma. So I've never seen a destigmatization program work without a robust treatment capability, um, both within the health profession as health, you know, doctors and nurses, where there's a huge amount of stigma in many of these instances, uh, as well as in the larger civil society. Um, without that in place, you are not positioned to effectively diminish the stigma. Um, I think that what needs to change is who we call to the table. Uh, we will not, through a bilateral effort, successfully treat the burden of disease that we already know is out there. We need to aggressively change the discussion to include a call of responsibility to the larger global community to look at what is the need that you are capable of responding to or contributing to the response. Activities such as the Global Fund, other bilateral, Unitaid um, uh, uh, type efforts, uh, the, uh, there are a number of emerging uh, strategies around kind of basketing of resources. All of these need to be looked at, probably convened by multilaterals, but then uh, thought through and made real through a country-based led discussion where these multiple divergent resources are then looked at and added up at the country level to address their desire to move to universal coverage uh, and address that large unmet need. We will not be able to do it alone. We need to admit that and engage with our colleagues on the planet to uh, converge resources. Uh, picking up on that, obviously this is a multilateral effort. It's a global problem. The U.S. historically has been the largest donor of these programs. Still, still remains. Still remains, in addition to many other programs. And with the economy here you know, being uh, a challenge, it will be difficult, as you said, to fund this. Uh, what do you think needs to happen for other countries to get on board and to uh, provide more funding to these programs? Does the administration plan on uh, convening any international conferences or summits on this issue to kind of call other countries to action? Well, I have been charged with starting this conversation, and it is well along the road of beginning uh, discussion at both the UN WHO levels, uh, Global Fund as well. Um, we need to prime the pump with that discussion. We need to engage bilaterals who are capable of identifying resources that can go toward this to do it. Uh, that will be in some convening discussions and also kind of private discussions as well. Uh, all of that has started. Uh, the UN and WHO are planning to convene at the country level a robust discussion on the 200 to 350 challenge for universal coverage. Uh, we will participate and support that actively. Uh, but I think that this will require leadership on the president, the secretary's level, uh, to 
challenge our colleagues in countries at the G8 level in particular to look at this differently and to commit differently to it. Countries that can need to be challenged, why not? That discussion needs to happen. I think that both uh, the Secretary and the President are in a position to actually put that challenge out. You know, what's interesting is obviously the Global Challenges series that we have focuses on these Millennium Development Goals and the prevention and treatment of HIV AIDS is one of those eight uh, uh, segments of that program. Uh, Dr. Kenya, have you seen in the countries that you have visited and worked with um, a greater kind of um, cooperation with the multilaterals in addressing this issue or do they want to focus on their own problem and get the assistance through their ministries? I've seen definite cooperation amongst all sectors of the communities and the countries that I've been to visit as well um, as my research replicates out of Paul Farmers in Haiti and um, that the mode that we really work on it's called the community health worker model and this is not rocket science you take people from the community laypersons you train them and then you send them out to the community to provide support services education and increase access to care and I see that model as being a viable opportunity for us to really encourage the countries that we work with to take ownership of their programs the money that we save on the money that we save on additional, you know, the additional transmissions that might be prevented can be used to pay salaries and encourage employment in those countries. And also, that's very, very effective in changing what social norms are and what's socially acceptable. To have peers on the street coming to your home telling you about what HIV is, how to take your medicines, how to access treatment, why you might want to get tested, and why you need to adhere to your medications. In doing that, you have community representatives educating people and changing what is considered acceptable, saying, hey, I'm gay, or my brother is a man who had sex with another man, and he's still a human being. And I have never seen those types of changes occur in a society and I'm going to give, a, I'm very young in my observations of what's, what happens in society, but I've never seen those changes occur from the top up. Uh, you know, your work is focused on urban communities in Miami and you've said before that there are a lot of similarities between what those populations experience and what someone in an impoverished country would. Absolutely. What kind of lessons learned can domestic U.S. AIDS policy learn from the international experience? Oh my goodness, that's a loaded question. Um, we can learn that our resources need to be comprehensive. For example, when I went into Overtown and I was recruited to the University of Miami to do this, we had no HIV testing. So obviously you're not going to have any impact on HIV prevalence um, if there is no HIV testing. Um, so, and also using the, our local community partners, I think that our communities are urban inner city communities and ideally I mean it's ideal this conversation is happening in Washington DC where our HIV rates do mirror that in many parts of many of the worst areas of the world um, I haven't seen any community health workers since I've been here in Washington DC telling me about HIV education and I look like the target population and that's what I think we need to see more of I haven't seen any billboards but what I do see is every time I walk down a street in DC and I see more than one minority I try to estimate in my head how many are HIV positive and it's scary as an American in our American you know, society, in our capital, that that's what I'm thinking about. So the lessons that I've taken from Haiti and from Cuba and from Thailand are really pay attention to the behaviors that are increasing transmission. Throw your morality out the door. You're going to sit here and judge people, then you're going to increase the, you're going to increase poor outcomes and more racial and class disparities in HIV. Thank you very much. We'd like to have a good time for a discussion. I know there's a lot of policy folks in the audience, so if you could raise your hand and then come up to the mic closest to you and just say your name and your organization and keep it to a question and to one of the panelists. Sir? Dr. Goosby, congratulations. Good to see you. You've done a great job. And uh, I'm working in Russia, as you may know. Yeah. Two questions. Sorry, your name and your organization? Harvey Sloan, the Eurasian Medical Education Program. Thank you. Uh, two questions. We know that the need is far outstripping our ability to uh, deal with this epidemic, particularly from a medical standpoint. My first question is, what kind of money is PEPFAR, the Global Fund, the CDC, all the organizations that can help 
put on finding evidence-based information about how to protect people and prevent the spread of HIV? First question. Second question, I'm glad you were abusing uh, social network and uh, marketing, but I was surprised you didn't uh, mention texting. Uh, Haiti today is being, people are getting around by texting. Oh, taxi. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not taxing. Yeah. Texting. Yeah. Texting. Oh, I'm <laughs> just kidding. It's, uh, yeah. it's a generational thing, right? <laughs> I got it. Too. Yeah. I, I have, in my travels abroad, I almost feel that the best thing we could do would be distribute a cell phone mm -hmm. to everybody and so they can get that information. You don't, Dr. Kenya, you don't go through the missionary hospital. You don't go through the mores of that society. You directly hit that person who wants to get an information about uh, that particular way of treating disease or not getting it. So thank you very much. Yes, well, it's good to see you, Harvey. Uh, uh, I think that um, the way that we are looking at our prevention shift, is the way I'd say that, um, is in each country. We're not looking, I mean, it doesn't matter what the total PEPFAR pot kind of does, prevention, treatment, uh, care, in, in, unless you translate that into how it translates into program. Uh, we are trying to basically put each country that we're in um, certainly the 17 focus countries, but even as you move up into our 30 country level, uh, there are prevention opportunities that present themselves, especially in Eastern Europe, Russia, the stanzas, all of those need to be addressed as prevention opportunities, where the prevention pot's gonna be bigger than the treatment pot. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of a shift. We wanna be in a position where our prevention effort has engaged on every front we think affords an opportunity. Um, in terms of taxis, um, <laughs> I think that um, we, uh, you know, I've been in this work long enough to have that kind of be something that I didn't see as an opportunity initially. Uh, I said whatever people want to do with that, great, uh, but have come 180 degrees anyway, not full circle, but 180 <laughs> degrees to wanting to test it. Uh, I want to take it to scale in one or two countries. Where we've already engaged in choosing the countries. We already have the resources to do it. To show whether or not an aggressive kind of informatic approach, uh, e-med, e-health type approach, uh, to prevention and treatment from uh, high-risk populations targeted for high-risk messaging uh, recurrent kind of case management opportunities so we don't lose people uh, to adherence and loss to follow-up strategies, especially where there's no addresses on the majority of the patients we're seeing, uh, to use that as a means through which we can identify, enter, and retain patients in care. Uh, we are going to take that to scale probably in Rwanda, although not finally decided, because they're almost, they are very, um, eager to do it and have put a lot of things in place to do it. Uh, and then in a country that's not ready to do it, that will need a lot more infrastructure support. But I'm right there with you to really try to understand if this is indeed uh, the tool that we think it might be. Thank you. This gentleman here had his hand. Thank you. David Shear, uh, Strategic Partnerships. Uh, we are working with the uh, Friends of the Global Fund through the UN Foundation, both in uh, Africa, Asia, and in Europe. As, as we uh, pursue our work, uh, clearly the refunding of the, of the Global Fund coming up this year obviously is a, is a centerpiece. One, we wonder uh, if you would uh, let us know the, the strategy of PEPFAR at this point in time in terms of supporting that effort. Secondly, as we work on the implementation side of this in Africa, we see increasingly the importance of sustainability. And that means obviously linking with USAID, the bank, and other international organizations with respect to the development side. And if you could talk to that a little bit too, I think that would be very interesting for us. Sure, those Thank are you. two good questions. Uh, the Global Fund kind of is the future. Um, it would be the short version of it. Uh, it is a pot of money that everybody contributes to, that goes to country, and then is transformed into program. There are issues with all of that in terms of taking that pot and efficiently trans 
forming it into programmatic responses. Uh, the presence and use of technical assistance, when technical assistance is introduced, how it relates to the principal recipient, how the community, uh, the, court, the country coordinating committees, uh, the CCMs uh, are convened, how they deal with a kind of inherent conflicts of interest, uh, how you deal with a transgression when a, uh, an error or a corruption is found, uh, how technical assistance should come before a cessation of resources. Uh, all of those things the Global Fund is acutely aware of. Uh, we sit on their board and have engaged in conversation with the leadership and the secretariat uh, that, in, um, that raises my level of com comfort and confidence that they are indeed moving on all of those fronts. Um, we are having a board meeting at the end of this month that addresses all of those issues and the issue of eligible funders. How do you compare unmet needs across different countries of different ec economic uh, capability? Uh, but it is probably the means through which rich countries can support resource poor countries. And we need to look hard at the Global Fund to make it everything it needs to be to be efficient and effective at making that transition. Um, the PEPFAR really, through the appropriation, uh, gives a third of the money to the Global Fund and has really since its beginning. Uh, we're around a billion five hundred now, uh, 1.5 billion or so, uh, in the amount of money the U.S. citizens, the U.S. Uh, Congress allocates to the Global Fund. We see that as uh, a conduit through which these resources can effectively move, and we need to think about who contributes to the Global Fund and support in every way uh, efforts to increase that, uh, that contribution uh, and the countries contributing. Uh, I think there's more room to go with that. Thank you. The woman in the third row. Hi, Nandini Woman from the Center for Global Development. Thanks to CSIS and the Knight Center for uh, hosting this event and, of course, Ambassador Gooseby for sharing time with us when you have a lot more to do. Uh, but I uh, actually wanted to raise the issue. You've talked a lot about scale-up and impact, and I think all of us in this room are... Um, absolutely behind you in the approach that PEPFAR2 has taken, but there is a lot of concern about what is meant by scale-up given that uh, successful prevention often is very much at the community-based level. And so how are you thinking, and I know you are working through these things, but it would be um, useful for us to know how you're thinking about measures for success that will uh, allow you to report both to Congress as well as to beneficiaries about how money from the U.S. and other um, countries is being used effectively to actually prevent infection. Mm -hmm. So to be succinct, you know, could you walk us through what you mean by scale up? Uh, what are some of the measures for success? Um, and how will you incentivize countries to be able to measure those successes and report at a country level? I mean, I think global measures don't make sense when we're talking about prevention mm. given the contextual nature. So that, that just uh, maybe a country example mm. like South Africa would be useful. Thanks. Thank well, I think that it's been the, um, the, uh, the million dollar question or multi-million dollar question to figure out the uh, surrogate markers of pre successful prevention efforts. Uh, what are the outcomes? Uh, the number of preventions uh, uh, averted, uh, the number of infections perverted is a difficult thing to kind of reliably quantitate. Uh, our, um, our thought, and we are actively working on what these markers will be um, and should be, and we're also engaged uh, with both UNAIDS and WHO in trying to define these same markers because the whole planet needs them. Uh, we uh, are going to move forward anyway, uh, and uh, by scale up I mean taking your demographics, understanding where your virus is moving within those populations, not 20 years ago, but in the last year, uh, where your new seroconversions are located, and then backward position our programs, our prevention programs, so those communities are interfaced with and connected to our prevention effort first, and then go to the general population. 
So for concentrated epidemics, um, it makes a lot of sense. But it also makes a lot of sense to target communities that have that have generalized in the same way because there's really no other way to target them. But to be smart about how we position those prevention interventions with that generalized epidemic. Um, looking for opportunities where people are convened, where people are receptive, uh, where we don't have to build it from the ground up. Uh, those types of efficiencies can make a big difference. And then eliminating redundancies or ineffective programs. And we've gotten to the point where we need to do that. I think that our ability to measure this is going to be best reflected in an impact on incidents. And we are hoping, and that's a big statement, as you know, but we are hoping that we can take surrogate markers of incidents as you get with your prenatal numbers and use that as a ballpark figure to get under. Um, and not exactly um, sure that that's the, certainly not the only thing we'll do, but that is kind of where the thinking is settling out now. We've got some of our best thinkers in our country and in Europe helping us think through this. Uh, and once we get an internal position, we'll take it to the, commu to the larger community to actually get a reaction. But we, as I said, are moving forward with it uh, aggressively now. The fourth row? Sorry. Yeah, David. David Bryden with the um, uh, Infectious Disease Society of America. Uh, the dedication to a research-driven approach, uh, evidence-based approach, is certainly very welcome. We're extremely excited about what we're hearing about that. Uh, two questions, if I could squeeze them in. Uh, one for Dr. Goosby. How do you anticipate pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, if it proves efficacious changing uh, our approaches uh, in the nature of HIV prevention? Uh, and, and for Dr. Nyberg, I'm wondering, I was a little concerned that in, among the specific recommendations in your report, there isn't any recommendation for scaled up uh, funding. And uh, when it comes to prevention itself, the Futures Institute has shown uh, with their modeling $200 million extra each year over the next five years for male circumcision would be an enormous uh, savings uh, in, over the long terms in terms of averted need uh, for treatment. Uh, what we've seen over the past couple of weeks, Americans willing to open their wallets uh, for Haiti at an enormous level, $200 million so far, even with a tremendously difficult economic picture. Uh, does what, what you, we've seen so far in terms of Americans willing to donate more, does that give you any hope that, that uh, the U.S. government might actually be uh, willing to keep or able to keep its promise uh, to double foreign assistance? and scale these programs up in the, in the way that they, they need to if a compelling case is made, uh, and, and even emotional case is made, that this needs to be done in the way that obviously Haiti has moved people. Thank you. So let's see, the first uh, question was, um, I got, I, you took me right into that second one. I was concentrating on that, <laughs> sorry. Um, so what was the first issue? Oh, prep. Oh, prep, yeah. Um, Pre-exposure proof is probably something uh, that uh, um, has reached the threshold of um, we need to plan for its implementation. Um, we are uh, concerned that some of the data uh, and the length of time that it's taken uh, to get this control group straight has been very frustrating. Uh, we have taken the step uh, to engage in preliminary planning around what we would need to do to move that to scale. Uh, if we do get data that shows efficacy, we would move it to scale as a central piece of our prevention effort. Uh, it would probably take the form of high-risk groups uh, and not be a general population focus. Um, injection drug users, sex workers, some MSM uh, strategies should include it. Uh, there are also some situations with women who are disempowered uh, in uh, relationships where that would also make sense. Um, I think that the ability to um, look at how that impacts the ARV, total ARV need of a country is pretty breathtaking when you kind of do the numbers on it. Uh, so we are actively looking at how we would uh, try to move that to scale. There are also a number of foundations, uh, not the least of which uh, is, a, is an activity convened by the Gates Foundation and Steve Becker up there, uh, who uh, is really trying to tease out 
um, the nuances of populations that indeed will benefit more than others with that strategy uh, and to uh, look at the implications for movement to scale. So. Yeah, I, I think the question about scale up of prevention is, um, <clears throat> is, is that, I think the answer is relatively simple, which is that, um, I mean, the intention uh, of, of that paper was to uh, sort of capture that as, as the major issue. Most of the people involved in the meeting that led to this paper, uh, including the, the, the two of us who ended up uh, writing, are involved with the Global HIV Prevention Working Group. And for those of you who know that, I mean, scale up is their major issue. Um, so if, if, it, if that didn't come across in the paper, then I need to go back and, and look at that. But uh, obviously, um, the scale up on the prevention side means uh, increasing competition for resources with, with the care and treatment pieces. And so that has to be handled very carefully. But, um, but scale up is definitely a, a, a high priority, the highest priority in, in the prevention area. The fourth row. Hi, thank you so much for um, for having this roundtable. Um, I had a question that specifically deals with young people, um, ages 15 to 24. Um, as as we know that this is still um, the population of some of the highest rates of new HIV infections, and I would like to um, pose this question to all of you um, about some suggestions about how young people, um, how the, your prevention strategy could be more youth friendly and incorporate young people, and maybe some specific details on how young people will tie into your um, prevention strategy. And I'm Nikki Manguli from Advocates for Youth. Thank you. Anyone, you Do you want me to take the first part of that? Um, I think that if we allow the demographics of the epidemic to lead how we position our prevention interventions, uh, they will not be ignored. Uh, I think that youth have always presented a <laughs> difficult population to identify, uh, test, and enter into care and keep in care uh, for um, a lot of uh, reasons that have to do with just social uh, maturation and self-perception. Uh, those differences need to be incorporated into the strategies. Uh, I think that Harvey's uh, suggestion that texting and uh, phone informatic type strategies might make sense even in very resource poor settings for uh, youth populations makes a lot of sense. And then there's always the traditional um, kind of uh, athletic uh, uh, for general information dissemination uh, convening around um, musical stars, pop music, uh, rock music or whatever, local music, having athletic events convene, uh, the upcoming uh, soccer tournaments that are kind of running throughout many of the countries we're in afford opportunity for that and we've already partnered with those types of organizations to saturate uh, the World Cup activity with prevention messages that are really looking to hit youth. So, Dr. Just, uh, Kenya, since you've worked with a lot of communities, both outside yeah. and inside the U.S., and specifically with minority communities. I think it's twofold. I think in order for youth to be involved, um, we have to empower them, one, with the education so that they can be involved, as well as the resources, similar to the Truth Campaign, which is the only thing that had any impact on tobacco and youth. It was youth-led, of course, it was funded and still is funded by the tobacco companies, but perhaps <laughs> that could be something that the music companies or the alcohol companies could participate in and provide the resources so that the youth could lead with their own messages. I'm a big proponent of community-based participatory research. Unless you involve the target community in your program planning, you're not going to be effective. One, though, one thing the youth can't do, though, is they're not in a position to dictate what policies um, provide them with what types of education. And as we know, the big federal funding joke, whereas if you receive a certain amount of federal funding to provide certain types of health education, you are not allowed to discuss you know, condom use and things, a lot of issues um, around that that were big in the former administration. I think that we really need to actively address those and we need to look at we need to look at those very seriously not as not as I think how do I want to frame this this has not been taken seriously in this country the way that we educate our youth 
and they do make up 50% of the new infections, and that's the same throughout the world. And in other parts of the world, the youth are even less able to participate in public health efforts. And I think that we need to do more for the population that does present the greatest new risk. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, just uh, something to follow on <clears throat> these last two comments, plus in addition to following on something that Dr. Kenya said earlier, I, I've always been amazed that uh, um, the, the Know Your Epidemic uh, conversation that UNAIDS and WHO have been discussing for the last five, five or six years includes the way it's presented, only recent infections as opposed to knowing your epidemic in terms of the risk behaviors in the community, looking at behavioral surveillance as well as disease surveillance. Um, and it seems to me that expanding that idea to, to behaviors is one way of bringing in youth. And, and the issue with youth really is that learning things right the first time is much easier than unlearning, unlearning uh, bad practices and then relearning the, the right way. Okay. Well, because we only have a few minutes, I just want to um, ask Dr. Gooseby if he has any thoughts he'd like to share with this public policy kind of audience about what your next steps will be in terms of carrying the PEPFAR strategy forward both you know within this administration to get the funding and globally. Well thank you. Um, you know PEPFAR has been about saving lives and that is what it will continue to be about. Uh, we are going to increase our ability to be uh, efficient at uh, continuing uh, that effort to save lives, but also uh, as efficient and as aggressive in our efforts to try to prevent new infection. Uh, we are going to um, move in a deliberate and specific way to challenge uh, our program services in country to reside and embed themselves in the public sector gradually over time uh, because we feel it is the best way to ensure that these services remain there for the <laughs> populations that we've already committed to. Uh, the President and the Secretary are fully committed to that effort. Uh, I would say it is up amongst their highest priorities and um, it is uh, with that conviction that I uh, agreed to move forward with this work. Thank you very much. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Sanjaya Kenya from the University of Miami, Dr. Eric Gooseby, also Ambassador for Global AIDS Coordinator for the Obama Administration, and Dr. Philip Nyberg from CSIS for presenting these unique perspectives. And the good news is that there is a strategy that this issue does have a lot of attention and priority. Obviously, it needs more resources. But um, it's good to see that the administration has a plan. Obviously, this is within the larger global um, framework that this needs to be implemented and also uh, funded and uh, this series the global challenges series is kind of addressing some of the key challenges within that uh, we have these Millennium Development Goals this is one of the priorities but how do we move that agenda forward with different countries sometimes who have laws that unfortunately discriminate against their own citizens and um, we have these guidelines on how money can be spent, so it's obviously very challenging, but it's good to see progress being made on some challenging issues. Um, the next uh, session, we have one every month, and if you're on the email list for CSIS, you will receive it. We do have a uh, Miami series at CSIS.org as an email address if you want to send any thoughts, uh, but we would love to see you participate in another session. And I just wanted to take a moment to reflect on the prior session that we had. We actually had the Haitian ambassador um, with us at one of our prior sessions speaking about Haiti's goals in meeting the development, Millennium Development Goals. And um, he had uh, shared with us that a cruise line was going to be going to Haiti and that this would really help their economy. And um, they had a really positive outlook. And it was really devastating to see what happened with the earthquake and how that's going to affect the country's ability um, to respond to this natural disaster, but also meet these goals that they already were struggling to meet. So, I just wanted to reflect on that and um, have everyone give a moment of thought to all the victims in Haiti. Uh, I know all of you are probably doing something to help global issues, but um, Haiti is definitely a country that needs all of us. So I want to thank you again for your time, for attending, and we hope we see you at another session of the Global Challenges Series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.